The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. Hope Housing is championing the great Aussie dream for our everyday heroes, police, nurses, paramedics, teachers and more by reinventing the way they buy homes. Hope's shared equity housing model means your clients can now access the property investment returns they've come to love without the hassle of being a landlord and at the same time enabling affordable home ownership for a deserving frontline worker. It's the win-win Australia needs right now. G'day, how's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. I'm here with Chris. Mate, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be here, Clayton. Yeah, so we've the last couple of years have bumped into each other uh, over in Cebu, which is VBP's um, HQ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we just the amount of time I spend laughing talking to you was reason enough to have you on the podcast. But beyond that, you, you know, you've got this uh, long career in financial planning. Uh, you've you've certainly got this interesting sort of experience in the world of associations, mm-hmm. um, and you know that then sort of goes into uh, uh, what would you call it? like dealer groups and licensing? And then of course, um, what independence is and there's an interesting sort of thread that I'd like to sort of, um, you know, sort of follow with you. Uh, let's start at the top. Mm-hmm. Please explain to us, uh, the association that you're a part of and you know, why it's a little bit different to what, what else is out there? Okay. It's an advisor association and, uh, I can I can hear all the listeners thinking that's exactly what we need another advisor association. <laughs> Two of them amalgamated, so we've got to have another one pop up. And we've been in uh, we've uh, we've uh, sort of been in existence a little over a year. So it's CIFA, C I F A A, uh, and we're an association for independent advisors. So that's those who satisfy nine two three A. And uh, why do we exist? Basically, we are a voice for independent advisors. Uh, we are a brand that they can use on the website and emails and talking to clients. Uh, and we hope to build in membership over the years, uh, perhaps influence some policy, uh, certainly get the word out there as far as being an independent advisor and the importance, importance of it. And also encouraging uh, advisors who aren't quite independent yet. Uh, let's call them independent in spirit, but technically not. Uh, to kind of make those final steps and move across. And we kind of talk to a lot of advisors and they say, oh, I don't really see the, the point. So maybe we talk about that a little bit. I think it is mm-hmm. worth taking those extra steps to move over. You can satisfy. But that's basically what uh, CIFA is. Uh, with a membership for uh, financial advisors who are independent. Right. And uh, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, before we even get to, you know, as, as you mentioned, what is the point or not, what do you find is the limiting factor to what, what, what's, what's generally or the most common reason uh, that a certain advice process or business model um, what gets in the road of qualifying in the first place? Like what, what is sort of the, the general environment that you come across that you think, oh, you're, yeah, this, this happens all the time. Um, but it's real, real simple. I assume to just to do something else. Yes. Yeah, so to be independent, you can't receive any commissions. You can't be associated with, you know, a product provider or a bank or what have you. And you can't charge in any other way that might influence the advice. So the main two that sort of uh, disqualify you are receiving insurance commissions, even trail commissions, any of that, and yep. being a part of a dealer group. So those are the big two. And I'd say for a lot of people, they are charging flat fees. A lot of people have structured their business now that they're not taking the risk commissions. Yeah. But they're still a member of a dealer group 
and they haven't quite made that move to their own overtel or, or what have you. That oh, so you have to be yeah. self-licensed. Specifically, you can't use someone else's license. Yes, unless that license is specifically they're all independent advisors. If one of those advisors takes a commission, right. then that sort of disqualifies the lot. Got you, got you. That makes sense. Okay, so, I mean, if we look at even the last, I think the last month or the last quarter, I can't remember. I was I was on, um, I was looking at the data on wealthdata.com.au. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Colin. Um, I was looking at his data the other day and there was, it was, it was like there was a hundred new licensees in the last, whatever the period was and 60 of those. So the majority were of either one or two advisor practices, which, Mm. which I mean, tells me automatically that, or, you know, even though they're smaller businesses, it's easy to tell that they are certainly my, you know, like self-licensed. So, so. It's kind of the transition period or, or the trend is aligned, uh, you know, to a big a big dealer group, and then typically to a smaller dealer group, and then you get the courage to kind of start yeah, your own right. license. That kind yeah. of looks to be the trend. Mm-hmm. So, so that's certainly happening. Um, do you do you expect this to continue? And uh, in or, or, I guess. What do you see as the benefit or, or where do you see advice going as a result of it? Uh, so, yes, I would expect it to continue. I think there's going to be a lot of people getting their own license. There's going to be a lot of people sort of joining up with other firms and then they go out and get their own license. I actually spoke to uh, a group of advisors I know when I was a part of a dealer group. They were part of the same dealer group and they were tossing up, okay, do we get our own license or do we move to another dealer group? I think... Uh, the experience, uh, unfortunately for people in dealer groups, there's going to be a lot of movement. This dealer group's been sold to them and and what have you. As we can see, that's sort of happening a lot at the moment. And the problem is if they go, oh, we don't like who we've been sold to, we're going to move to another dealer group. And then all of a sudden, all that dealer group's been sold to another group. And it's just going to be this sort of continual change. And I think obviously advisors have had a lot, uh, enough of change for the moment. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the the own AFSL is somewhat of a scary option. It's not. Uh, it's not all about available to anyone. You obviously have to have a certain size or be willing to sort of take on that workload. It does take time, and you've got to do it properly. But if you yeah. can do it, I would recommend doing it. It is well worthwhile. You can set up your policies and your procedures and practices in a way that suits your business, makes sense to your business. You don't have yes. to have compliance for the lowest common denominator. All makes sense. You make a decision, decision's made, and then you run your business properly. So I think it's it's worth doing, yeah. Interesting. What what What's happened, well, what do you feel has been the result uh, since, since moving into an independent license, since being, you know, qualifying for that independence tag, have you, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can kind of view it. There's there's obviously like business performance, you know, revenue. There's yep. also um, sort of uh, that internal feeling of pride, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also the impact of what your clients think. If we kind of like, you know, if we kind of sort of picked apart those three, wh- what's the emotional reaction that you get from it? What's the professional result that you've re- achieved? And Kind of most importantly, do your clients care? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, so I sort of started the practice uh, and um, wasn't intentionally, oh, I've got to satisfy these rules and I want to be independent. And so that's going to be a massive advantage. I just actually made these decisions and then realized, okay, uh, yeah, I did have a tiny bit of insurance commission. Um, I was a member of a dealer group, but then we set up an AFSL and I went, oh, actually, I can just make a couple of changes and uh, Robert, your father's brother, we're independent. We can do that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, now having done it, I don't know why I didn't do it earlier. It's one of those right. things you don't really realize the benefits until you've done it. 
And I speak to a right. lot of advisors, and it doesn't take much. There, some I spoke to one the other day, and he had a tiny bit of trial commission. It wouldn't have been that difficult for him to make that change, but he just said, oh, "I don't really see the value." And here's the key thing: clients are looking for independent advisors. There is some information out there, and it's getting out into the general public. It's not a massive wave at this stage. We do think it's going to grow, but there are people who are seeking out advisors who are independent. Um, so I know I can see who's come from the CIFA website to our website. You know, over the last month, there was like 15. Uh, so that's not bad. So we are getting clients who are searching out for independent financial advisors. But if you're not independent, they don't actually ring you and say, oh, by the way, I was going to make a phone call, but I see that you're not independent, so I'm not doing it. So you never see that value. They don't tell you, you don't see that, uh, you don't see that loss. Uh, yes. But it is there. Uh, the other thing is it just makes the whole process as far as uh, your existing clients and also new clients, it, it makes things a little bit easier because, you know, the financial planners don't have the best reputation and people are scared and when they're dealing with their life savings you need all the help you can get yes. to allay their fears it yes. makes sense that they're a little bit afraid so sure, yeah put their trust in someone to provide yes. financial advice so yes if you can do something to say okay well we're different we know you've heard a few horror stories in the past yeah um we're a little bit different uh you know because of these reasons that's helps and, and what we get from people who are quite independent they say oh my clients don't care and it doesn't make you know much of a difference but we think it does you just probably don't see that difference it makes things a little bit easier and mm. you know move along a lot quicker and then you put that in with the fact that you are a good advisor they can see as you're going through the process that you are doing things and acting in their best interest just makes things easier so it's not like the panacea but it really makes things a lot easier as far as dealing with new clients and also your existing clients. They might yep. be more inclined to refer, you know, go see go see Clay or whoever, yeah. an independent advisor, um, makes it a little bit little bit easier. Interesting. And so, okay, so the, there's the there's a growing trend um, towards self licensing. Does that and 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 I you know I can definitely look at the data to see that. Where does the association part fit in? So um, I follow all of the uh, all of the thinking. Is it is the point of the association then to is it to promote independent financial planning or is it to put pressure on the wider uh, on the wider profession to to join? The, is is this? Is the reason for because and there was a great quote um, the the CFP board in in America there was a there was an article that I saw recently and and one of the best lines was um, you know the journey from an emerging profession to an established profession is still ahead of us right like the, the, we've come a long way yeah. a huge a huge amount of distance has, has been traversed however. And 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 if I was looking at sort of a, a scale, I would put us over the fifty percent mark. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly in this, certainly in this country, yep. and and we're 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 still on that journey. Is this is the prof, is the association designed? You know, we've got the F AAA now, right? Like, which mm-hmm. is it, it's it's a big association. The main two combined is the point of CIFA to say to the F AAA, hey. Uh, we should be doing this or is it to say to is, is it to be more i guess what i'm saying is is it for the the profession and the professionals or is it for clients and and to educate them or is it both it's both it's both at the moment the focus for us is clients and to educate them uh, as far as get the word out there the importance of independent advice uh, and so that's a focus at the moment, but also the focus is to, uh, as I was talking about, educate advisors. It actually does matter. It is worthwhile. Make that change. And I think in years, it's just going to naturally happen that mm. people will take these steps. You know, new businesses will probably be starting uh, with their own AFSL 
um, and you will also have less people taking commissions, more people charging flat fees. So you're going to have people naturally moving to satisfying 923A and and therefore you're going to have more members join our association and, yes. and at that point of difference is going to grow. Uh, so we do want it to be it's a point of difference and that's not to kind of sling mud at everyone else. No. It is to uh, help the consumer make the choice and, and trust the advisor you know, more than they otherwise would, just to help them along the way. So that's the point. And yeah, when we get a certain amount of size, hopefully we can help influence policy and, and what have you, which is something we're working on, but it's, I guess, not the focus at the moment. The focus is getting the word out there to consumers and to advisors. Awesome. I've got some, I got some kind of uh, questions around self-licensing in the, in the sense of the business models that, that kind of pop up. Um, Mm -hmm. we're seeing sort of the growth of the asset consultant, real interesting story. I've kind of done a bit of a deep dive on this recently. So early two thousands, all the super funds have asset consultants, you know, APRIT says we need, we need to merge these super funds. And these new super funds get so big and they, they're merging. So there's less of them and, and they hire they hire internal teams <laughs> yeah. to be the asset consultants. So, and so you've got this kind of list of asset consultants who go, okay, well, there's not a lot of business anymore in super funds and, and sort of move down to uh, the the financial planner level. And yeah. then and the financial planner levels, you know, they were originally kind of looking at research with, with morning sec and uh, sorry, morning sec, morning star and lawn sec and in Zenith and, and, and whoever else. And they've kind of replaced that with the asset consultants. Mm. And so there's kind of this interesting um, situation where as financial planning companies have gotten bigger, uh, the asset consultants have shifted their views from super funds to, to advisors. Mm. Are you are you seeing this kind of trend amongst it, like within the the individually licensed or is it is it still because everyone's individually licensed that trend hasn't continued yet uh into your world it's not so i'm not so much seeing it here with the smaller firms i uh, am a l- little bit and again I, I guess with the independence piece you do need to be a little bit careful if you've sort of got your own discretionary accounts or, or what have you uh, and that you're that's not influencing the advice you are giving, and you're not basically trying to get everyone's assets on board uh, with your firm. So what you might be able to say to the client is, which I'm sure advisors do, uh, hey, look, we're going to look at your situation, we're going to look at all your assets, and we're going to put you on the right path, yada, yada, yada. But if you have a certain super fund, and that is the right super fund for you, and there's no real amazing benefit for moving elsewhere we're going to leave you exactly where you are i think that's the right thing to do by the client and it does become a conflict there if you've got oh these are our investments yeah you've made great investments uh there's going to be this incentive to well i want to get as many people on those investments as possible that's a very interesting point yeah because typically there is whatever amount of basis points there is typically uh, an incentive there so yeah i understand so 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 i guess in the independent world there's not a lot of smas no ah interesting interesting i i get that um yeah right that's uh that's a super interesting data point uh considering the rise of the sma but that might actually be a hindrance for some people to 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 join it. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Right. Oh, not nothing in the legislation that specifically uh, talks about that. And yeah. It has said it's not a problem for them. Uh, right. But I would be careful about doing that. Yeah. Because that awesome. might change their mind. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. So, are you saying that? Technically, if someone did have an SMA and there was an incentive in there, then under the current rule set, you could still call yourself independent. You could, you could argue that you're still independent and that's not influencing your advice. But yes. I, well, I would argue, well, it probably does influence your advice. It's the same with percentage-based fees. 
It's yeah, nothing yeah. Yep. specifically in the legislation that says, okay, you charge a one percent fee on assets under management, that you yes. can't call yourself independent. Right. Uh, and we put it on our website. There are members put whether well, we charge a flat fee. They all charge a flat fee. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So to be to be a part of CIFA, you you ha- you can't charge an asset based fee. No, it's just that we haven't had anyone come along that does have an asset based fee, and when they do have an asset based fee, we would say, okay, well, you know, it's a, we're not you can you you have to make sure that that's not influencing your advice. We'd strongly sure. I encourage you. And my experience is most people they've set up the firms their way just because they think that's the right way to charge. And yes. I think it is the right way to charge, and most people are moving that way anyway. So, yeah. Oh, look, a- yeah. absolutely. Um, I tend to agree. It's it's quite funny. Uh, you know, if, if you go back almost 10 years ago when Ensemble was known as XY Advisor, and, you know, we, we're all running our own uh, financial planning practices, um, a, a lot of us, quote unquote, younger, we weren't, I mean, kids, but we were, you know, like late 20s, early 30s, and we had our financial planning uh, companies. All we had known was, uh, asset based fees. And mm. so one of well, I'll never forget one of the very first things that we learned about was sort of stripping out, okay, well, this is financial advice and it doesn't have an, a, an asset based fee. And then over here is an investment fee and it does have an asset based fee. I remember that being one of the very first sort of concepts that I learned about, uh, you know, when, when, when I opened my first comp, uh, yeah, my, one my financial plan company. And that sort of premise really took me and, you know, the other founders, but also all of the financial planners who were around, you know, formerly XY Advisor at that time, we kind of all went through this huge journey together where, because, because the interesting thing about charging a flat fee, to me, the interesting thing is it forces you as an advisor to, to identify what it is that you do for a client. Mm-hmm. It, it then forces you to learn how to do that better. Mm. <laughs> So you then go through this, uh, you know, multi-year long process, often decades long process of further articulating and identifying what that financial planning value is and how you can get better at achieving a, a, a better outcome and a more valuable outcome for the client. So at its base, yes, it's flat fee versus asset fee, but what it means in a career is kind of two very different outcomes. If, yeah. if you're charging an asset-based fee, you're always going to be focused on the assets. Whereas yeah. if you're charging a flat fee for financial planning, you're constantly, you're constantly at a micro level and on a daily and weekly and monthly and yearly and bi-yearly, uh, you know, process. You are focused on what the outcomes are and ultimately identifying them and improving on them. Yeah, that's right. I remember when I started my own firm, a lot of I actually came from a stockbroking background. Right. I knew a lot of financial planners, and uh, a lot of them said, "Hey, that's silly. Don't go with the flat fee thing. You've got to charge some level of percentage." Da 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 da. And I'm really glad that I kind of stuck to my guns on that one. And you're right; it does force you to change the way you, I guess, pitch your services and advice and the way you deliver that. And yeah. importantly, you'd need to be able to say, okay, well, we, I'm, you're going to agree to pay me a fee before I give you any sort of advice. Um, and once you've agreed to pay that fee, the advice that I give it won't really matter to me as far as what I recommend. That's not going to change the amount of money I receive. That's really helpful. One in yeah, it helps the clients understand, okay, well, this guy is going to give me the right advice. He's not going to try to sell me anything afterwards. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that really helps, I think. Yeah. Um, here's a question in regards to uh, an ongoing service arrangement, right? Because one a, a, another kind of uh, subject that I used to think a lot about, and I still do to this day, even though I'm no longer a practicing advisor, What do you? Tr- what's your main goal in an ongoing advice environment? Is your main goal to say, here is what we discussed, here is what you wanted, this is the journey that you're on and how closely these results are tracking to it, and here are the kind of the, the milestones that you've been achieved, that, that, that you've achieved, and, and, and from, a, from a financial point of view, 
here, here are the milestones that we're trying to achieve. Like, do you try to share with your clients on a yearly basis how close they are to achieving both, you know, lifestyle and financial goals? Or, or is there something else that, that you do? Well, we've well? largely got a retiree climate, so we're retirement planning focused as an individual right. firm and everyone. So I guess I'll, I'll talk through what we, the onboarding process and what we tell clients. So we you know, have, I guess, as most advisors do these days, they say, okay, come in and have a chat. We're not going to deliver any advice. By the end of that conversation, we'll be able to give you a quote on this is what we're going to help you with and this is what the fee is going to be. And our firm, we quote an initial piece of advice fee. We're going to get you from where you are right now. We've gone through this process. We've delivered the advice and then we've implemented that advice and that's going to cost this much. And then the client will inevitably say, well, what are you, are you going to charge me anything after that? So what we tell clients is... If we see value in an ongoing relationship, we will offer that to you and you can choose to take that up or not. Importantly, there's no obligation to take that up and we're not structuring our advice to try to lock you into anything. We're actually doing the opposite. We are trying to make it as simple as possible for you. So if you are that way inclined, that you can manage as things going forward. You can choose to do that. And some people do that and other people at the end of the day say, no, I would like to engage you again for this next, we do 12-month contracts. Right. So, okay. So then we get to the 12-month contract. And that was your original question. What do we essentially do? Retirees. So a lot of the time their goal is, I want to live a comfortable retirement. I want to know I've got the money at the right times. I want to know I'm not spending too much. And I want to know if I can spend a bit more. Yada, yada, yada. So... It's not so much as the accumulators do. They say, well, I want to get high, you know, all these yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. They're probably at a yeah. point in their life, a lot of them, not all of our clients. Some uh, sort of have goals and aspirations. Of those. <laughs> but a lot of people, it's just, yeah, I want to help the kids. I want to yeah. not have to worry about the money and what have you. So what yes. we do is, okay, well, if we are looking after your situation, we're going to be available throughout the year, any sort of changes, and, you know, we will be there for you. Uh, it's particularly any sort of big movements in the markets, we're going to be available for you and, and help you with that. If there's, you know, quite often there's nothing, we'll have an annual review, we'll go through everything, we'll recommend any changes. So it's a typical sort of vanilla offering yep. that the most financial planners, uh, yeah, will we'll offer. Cool. Excellent. Aged care. So yeah. one, one of the super interesting things or one of the super interesting trends that um, I'm seeing in financial planning sort of on a global scale is because advisors, it's quite funny the results uh, of really good financial planning. Like sometimes they're totally unanticipated. Like, so, I mean, if you, if you talk about insurance for a second, right? Advisors were so good at giving financial planning, uh, sorry, giving insurance advice and making sure that every single one of their clients who were even remotely close to a claim got paid that in Australia kind of almost bankrupted the entire like <laughs> the entire the entire industry and the government had to come in and say well no you're not allowed to do this uh we're going to make it you know like a lot harder um and and ultimately a lot more expensive just so that the industry can survive so that's like like that's that's a wild outcome from good financial planning right another really interesting uh outcome from good financial planning is the fact that um, retirement advice is is really now genuinely turned into intergenerational and and age care. Mm. Um, it's almost like it used to be that retirement was like, oh, okay, we hit retirement. Now that's the second last phase. Now there's this whole age care phase, and you've got a lot of people with a lot of money who are not, you know, don't spend it all, right? So, mm. um, and then, and obviously with health. Uh, with health, you know, life expectancy going up, there's a lot, a lot of people uh, continuing to live long past their ability to to spend it, so to speak. Um, does your because you as as a retirement sort of um, focused practice, do you wade much into the aged care, or do you sort of when when things are getting to that stage and you're talking with the kids, does that move on to somewhere else, or do you like to keep it in house? We've been really 
uh, I guess, strict as to keeping within our swim lane as far as we're providing cool. retirement advice. I'm really glad I did that. I had so many people telling me, you know, you have to do risk and da 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 So I've kind of stuck to my medals there over the years and not moved outside of it. But if we did move outside of it, it would be really about providing more advice and services to the existing client base that we have rather than finding a new client base and services that so the things like aged care, uh, aged care planning and estate planning are the two keys if we which we are moving towards and that might take uh, a little while. But at the yeah. moment we provide relatively simple aged care advice to help in that space and otherwise we refer out. Awesome. And it's the same with the estate planning. We kind of looked at estate planning and, I, you know, we've made a compliance decision not to go down that road just yet. Yep. But we might might at some point in the time look at that. But those are the key. And I'd, you know, anyone sort of sort of starting out and trying to decide where they're going to focus, I would say focus on a particular demographic, a yep. type of client, a persona of client. And if you go really narrow, like I'm going to focus on principles, school principles, and provide advice to them. Or you can go a bit wider like us and go, well, I'm going to do retirement planning. But if you're looking at your website and it says we specialize in and it lists 15 things, you do not specialize in anything. So don't do that. Uh, And I'm really happy we did that. It makes, uh, you know, if we do get a client who doesn't fit that demographic, we're going to refer them on generally unless we really think we're the ones for them to uh, but if we get a retiree client and then they go and see three other financial advisors the other ones specialize in everything we usually get that client because we're really good at dealing with that client understanding them knowing everything sort of pointing towards helping them yeah so that is something i'm uh, really glad that i focused on that and has actually yesterday one of the in a staff meeting, they said, oh, should we actually think about moving and like dealing with accumulators? I was like, well, no, actually, we're going to stick with the one client. And if we are moving out, it's to provide more advice and services to that particular type of client. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the best um, terms I've heard in regards to what you were just discussing is um, your target. Sorry. Yeah, your target is not your market. So, So as in... If you walk past one physiotherapist and it says, we look after people with sore muscles, and then the next, the, the shop next to that physiotherapist is another physiotherapist that says, we work with the Australian cricket team. Me, my schlubby self says, uh, well, clearly I have to go to the physiotherapist that looks after the Australian cricket team, not because <laughs> I'm an elite sportsman by any means, mm. but. Uh, one is for everyone and one is a, is a speciality and a speciality that even though I'm not it, I align myself more to. And so, Mm. so it doesn't surprise me at all that if you say, Hey, we only do retirement that you pick up, you're more, you're just more likely to pick, pick those clients up. And, um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's a very, a, it's a very sort of universal rule. Yeah, there's a cost because there's a demographic you don't get and they go look at your website and then they don't give you a call. Uh, but that's yeah. fine. They can go to someone else who is specialised in that area. We would much rather get 80% of the people who are we are suitable for come in, yes. have the meeting, and then sign up happily. Yeah. Um, if, we, if we're to fast forward, you know, the last 10 years has been... Just you know, right? Uh, it's, just, <laughs> uh, it's been you know. I think right now it is pretty good. Um, yeah. You know, I, all, all the successful, uh, great advisors who stayed on, like yourself, have washed out the uh, the lower level of advisors like me who uh, who, who didn't who didn't stick around. <laughs> The cleansing has occurred, um, and so and so now it's actually quite um, it's it's quite a good environment, right? Like you know, demand is high, um, which which is fantastic. Let's you know whether or not QAR comes in at the end of the day, pretty obvious that there's going to be a, a winding back of a lot of the issues, uh, or, or or a lot of the um, the red tape, 
Yeah, yeah red tape, uh, oversight. Um, not so much oversight, but it's absurd levels of oversight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so where do you see advice headed in the next 10 years? Uh, as both a, um, you know, like a, a universal look, but also where do you see... Where do you see your practice? Where do you see CFA? Okay. Uh, so I think if you ask this question to most people, they're going to go, I think it's a great industry to be in. And I think it, they're right. It's a great industry to be in. I think demand for advice is as strong as it's ever been. I think the reputation of the industry is on the up. It takes time, but over time, that is going to be a real benefit. Uh, there are much higher barriers to entry into the industry that they have been in the past that does present some challenges it's also a gift Um, and hopefully fingers crossed a bit less regulatory change Um, so i think it is a great industry to be in as far as uh, sort of our firm well let's start with the the CEPA and the or association Uh, i think we uh, we're at the moment we're like a cricket club we're all volunteers it's a relatively low uh, membership fee. It's five hundred dollars for a year. If you are independent, crazy not to join. So go to have a look at the website um, <laughs> now. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think it will take time because it is difficult to transition to that independent uh, advisor. So you can tick that box. So there's probably it's hard to get data on it, but there's probably only a few hundred advisors in Australia who uh, uh, can call themselves independent. I think within sort of 10 years, there will be thousands. And I would hope that that would be a point of difference. Point of difference, a good point of difference. It just helps the, the client understand that, okay, this is how it works. I am more willing to trust this advisor. And I'll actually say, because I know people are going to be yelling at the podcast right now, because they're going to be saying, well, I'm, you know, blah, 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 doesn't influence my advice, and we know. But the point is it could, and it has in the past sure. some other firms, and it helps differentiate you. I mean, have a horrible analogy. We can cut this out if it doesn't work, right? <laughs> so here's an analogy. So my wife, this is true, she is terrified of birds, hates birds. If a bird flies in her general direction, she is convinced that it's swooping her particularly magpies, because magpies yeah. peck your eyes out. Not all magpies, just the odd bad apple magpie will peck your eyes out. And she's also, I don't know if you have this in Sydney, do you have mudlarks? She hates mudlarks. I don't know what a mudlark is. They're all over Perth, and they are a harmless little bird, <laughs> and they look exactly like a magpie, or they do to my wife. Right. Right, so you can trust a mudlark is not going to peck your eyes out, but you cannot tell my wife that. If she sees one, she is scared. So the analogy is, you know, the mudlark would be better served if it had a little badge on that says, hey, I'm not a magpie. And that's what <laughs> that's what being independent is about. You're able to say, okay, well, I've taken the steps in my business to structure things this way. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that helps you, the consumer, to understand the difference. We're not like they are. We know there's a few bad apples that have uh, that sort of upset everything. Yes. And this is just one thing. It just helps you a little bit as a consumer to understand yes. the difference. I got a little bit of there. How, how did that go? We might cut that out. Who knows? No, 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 no. That was, that, that, that's uh, that's a really good one. I um, and, and I mean, look, as as a former Hill Ross practice principal, yeah, one of the things that I tried um very much to do was to be as independent as possible. Mm. Um, and so I I do appreciate that. Yes, as you as you mentioned, you can be a part of it and not be a part of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, does it make sense for the mudlark to have a badge yeah. that's, uh, most, that's... Yeah. yeah, exactly. What most advisors now do with the dealer group, let's supposing you're licensed with IWF, is they can't legally get pressured to use IWF products. And what they want to do is they actually want to show to the client that they are not being influenced by their dealer group. So what do they do to prove that? Well, they don't recommend IWF products. As a way of saying, 
You see, I told you. <laughs> We're laughing about it, but it absolutely yeah. is occurring. It is absolutely, absolutely occurring. And so yeah. at much to the frustration of your dealer groups and where you go, okay, well, that model is not going to work anymore. And that's why you're seeing all the changes you're seeing like yeah. with IWF at the moment. Yeah. 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 Lots going on. That is, yeah. Look, I think you've nailed it. Um, that is a, it's a very interesting in, as I mentioned before, Hill Ross, uh, you know, which is owned owned by AMP, um, and and yeah, certainly one of the elements that was pretty common even even back then was to mm-hmm. see AMP advisors kind of using everything but AMP products. <laughs> right. um, and and it's and then and then you know it's kind of well. Is the advisor di- like now? Are you sure you're still non-conflicted? Because it's almost like that option isn't an option at all now. And you, it, yeah. like I, I haven't looked at you know product. Rec- I haven't looked at sort of the differences in products for quite a while. But there was actually some really good AP products. Yeah. Then, so uh, so you get a uh, the frustration of the boards. You know why, yeah. why are they recommending our product? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's a good product. Yeah. Oh goodness. Um. No, you, you're you're exactly right. So. Mate, I've, uh, I've, I think, um, I think by the sounds of it, we'll, we'll put it this way. I know, I know financial planners who are independent, uh, like a hundred percent. I'm not sure if that they're uh, part of your association or not, but I know that mm-hmm. they're independent. And I know, like when I hear them speak, they do drop it in as a part of their, call it a sales pitch, but it, it yeah. a value, a value offering, right? Mm-hmm. And whenever I hear it mentioned, I'm like, it, they only spend, you know, two seconds on it, right? But I always think to myself, wow, like the the ability to do that must feel good. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like it must it it must sound good to a to a, pr- a prospective client as well. And so when when I was asking you, you know, like what are the difficulties and what are the benefits? You can definitely see where the benefits are. You can oh, absolutely, see. and you don't have to drum it in. To the client's head, you just it's no. a little okay. This is something with us. I say it when I'm handing the client the FSG, and I just say, okay, well, look, here's our FSG, and blah 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 blah. And by the way, we're independent, da 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 da. And that's a much nicer experience than handing the client the FSG. There's the warning there, we're not independent, and then you have to explain that. Oh, yeah, but it's da 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 da. It's just much nicer. So, yes. uh, this is not about, I guess, the pooing everyone else. It's about saying, hey, that's actually really nice if you can call yourself independent. It does make a difference. It probably will help in your self-esteem as an advisor as well. Um, so if you are in the position, you can make those moves, even though they might take a bit of time. It's definitely worthwhile. And so maybe don't dismiss it as uh, and, as some of them do. And and I assume y- you guys might have some in-house or trusted or, or, or recommended people to assist with self-licensing and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people uh, give us a, give me a call or give me an email. Yep. Uh, go to the website. Go to the CIFA website, which is cifaa.asn.au. Uh, yep. Have a look at membership if you've got any queries, or you just want to choose a fat on sort of what you need to do. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to help. Awesome, mate. I am. I, I'm. I'm stoked that we got to do this. Like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We're we're uh, whenever we catch up in. Um, in the Philippines, it it you, yeah we do we do end up laughing a lot. So I you were the first person up. I met in the Philippines. I don't know if you know this, but I got off the plane. I went to the hotel. I was starving, and I was on the way down to get something to eat. And you were in the elevator, and you said, "Hey, are you here for the conference?" And uh, I said, "Yes." And you said, "Would you like to go out and get absolutely plastered?" And that's. <laughs> That's not actually what you said, but that's what my that's what I heard, and it was a good time. So next time I'll see you there. We'll do it again. So done and done. Well, mate, thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. And uh, thank you. for anyone that pleasure. wants to reach out, uh, uh, um, yeah, it's awesome that you're available for questions. So thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thanks, guys.